question to you this morning is what moves you? It's interesting as we really look at our lives and we realize that God has made us so amazing that everybody in this room is different, that God has placed certain burdens on individuals' hearts. But there comes a question that we have to ask ourselves and a truth we have to ask ourselves. What moves me to do God's will? What will move my life? Well, the truth is, is that most Christians are not moved. I had a teacher once, she, we were reading a book in Bible college. It's called The Divine Romance. I don't, has anybody ever read that book, The Divine Romance? It's God's creation. It's a story of creation um, written through uh, just a story. It's really pretty. It's just nice. And uh, so one day she comes to class and she says, well, class, I had an experience with the Lord last night. And I said, well, you know, we said, well, what was that? She says, well, I was sitting on the throne, you know, I was sitting in the toilet reading that book and I was just so moved. That's not the movement we're talking about today. There are a lot of people that need to start moving. Turn to someone and say, you got to move. Turn to somebody else and say, don't be a slug. What moves you? If this is the year of loving people, what will move you to love people? The Bible talks about it in the book of uh, Luke chapter 10. Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested Jesus, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? This is Luke chapter 10, starting with verse 25. And Jesus said to him, It is written in the law. What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength, and with all of your mind, and you shall love your neighbor as your you shall love your neighbor as your, you shall love your neighbor as your, we've been talking about this. The very first thing that we have to get in order, being a benevolent person does not mean that there's any eternal value to it at all. You and I must walk in the power and the demonstration of God's love. When we move in God's love, the anointing is released. When the anointing is released, there is eternal value. Where there's eternal value, there's eternal impact. And as a Christian, we have not been called just to do nice things, but we've been called to change our atmosphere, to change our, our situations, to change our region by the power of God. That comes through understanding this principle. If we love the Lord our God first, we love ourselves, we will love other people. So when we're not moved to help other people, we've got to ask what's wrong in our own hearts. Either we don't love God or we don't love ourselves. Because when we get this process in order, we will automatically, by domino effect, we will automatically, automatically start loving people. So when we're not being moved, we've got to ask ourselves a question. Where is the disconnect? Well, we know the disconnect is not that God doesn't want us to move. We know it's not God's problem and God's situation where he doesn't have a plan for us. So when God's plan, our movement forward to love people is not occurring, we have to say, God, is it that I don't love you and I put other things before you? Or, Lord, do I have a problem in myself that I need to be healed? Because when those two are in order, we will automatically do ministry. Am I all by myself? I thought I was in a Pentecostal church. Can I hear an amen? So here this man of the law, this lawyer came up to Jesus and asked him this question. And Jesus said to him, you have answered rightly, do this and you will live. But he wanting to justify himself to Jesus, and who is my neighbor, he said. Then Jesus said, a certain man went down from Je Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, who stripped him of all his clothes, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a certain priest came down the road, and when he saw him, he passed by the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came, looked, and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. Shout compassion. Shout compassion. Shout he had compassion. Compassion is the quality of showing kindness 
or favor, being gracious, having pity on somebody and seeing them in the position and saying, I've got to do something about it. Compassion is not sympathy where you just feel sorry for somebody, but it's empathy where you're willing to put your, ma- excuse me, your money and your mouth where your feet are. You're going to make something happen. Turn to someone and say, you got to make something happen. So the Samaritan had compassion. And so when he went, he bandaged his wounds, poured in oil and wine, and set him, in his, uh, set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. On the next day when he departed, he took two denarii and he gave them to the innkeeper and said to him, take care of him and whatever you, more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was the neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And he said, he who showed mercy to him. And Jesus said, go, shout go. Come on, shout go. Shout go and do likewise. Ooh, come on now. We're talking about loving people. There's a, a big thing in, our, in, the, in the body of Christ at large. Where the majority of churches and the majority of the people in the churches are coming to church on a Sunday once every three weeks is the average. They're coming to church every once every three weeks, sometimes every other week. And what they're doing is they sit, they placate God with their presence, and then they sit back and they live a life of hell through the rest of the week. There's a problem with that, can I hear an amen? It means you're backslidden. It means you're not right with Christ. It means if the trumpet of God would sound, you would not be going. Come on, would you rather me give you the truth or would you rather me just make it all pretty? You see, the truth will make you free. God in these last days is taking his kingdom so serious. We have never seen the signs and the times like we have today with what's happening in Israel right now, what's happening in the United States right now, what's happening monetarily right now. We have never seen this time. Prophetic utterances have been fulfilled, and we stand at the very threshold of eternity's trumpet ready to be bellowed. And when it sounds, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and those who are alive and remain shall be caught up together within the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So a sleep has come upon the body of Christ at large. A a slumber has come while the people are calling out. There's a necessity and a need for the church to arise, but the church is not arising because they're asleep in their cubicle. But God is sending a revival. He's sending out his Holy Ghost. He's sending and pouring out his Spirit upon those who are hungering and thirsting after righteousness, and they shall be filled. And it will not be many, the Lord would say, but he is raising up a people that will run for him, that will run after him. And as you run, the power power shall hit your feet and you shall run lengths you never thought of before and God is going to raise up these people in these last days but many shall be lost many shall be lost many shall be lost because their eyes are not on the Messiah but their eyes are on their own flesh Woo! thus saith the Lord brother that was playing music right there You see, God in these last days is serious about souls. What's so sad about this story in these last days is this. Is that the very first people that passed this man who was beat to the place of almost death, lying to the place where he was thought to be dead, were the religious. Those who called themselves quote-unquote Christians. Those who called themselves the followers of God. In fact, they were the preachers. The preachers walked by this man who was beat to, beat to a pulp and looked at him and literally crossed to the other side of the road. You see, as the church, come on now, the anointing flows from the head down. The Bible says in Psalms 133, Behold how good and how pleasant it is when the brethren dwell together in unity. It is like the oil that comes down over the head of Aaron, down over his outfit, down to the bottom of his, of his skirt, and it pours out over the body of Christ. It's there where the commanded blessing is. And the anointing flowing from the head down. If the preachers don't have a passion for the lost, if the preachers don't have a passion to reach and minister to those who do not know Christ, then the body of Christ will 
will lay dormant. But I'm here to tell you in this house, we are going to activate you. That flicker you might have in your spirit, I believe that God's Holy Ghost is going to pour forth a flame that you will be a raging forest fire, preaching the gospel of Christ with no fear and boldness. And no matter what anybody says, you will not be moved. You see, God is raising us up to do this particular, this special, this important call. But you see, the preachers, they walk by the sick. They walk by the people that have problems. They walk by those that are unacceptable to be in the house of God. We don't like to talk about that one. But there are people that others deem as unacceptable in the house of God. Whether it's because of their actions, whether it's because of their race, whether it's because of their, their heritage, whether it be because of their dress, whether it be because of their language, whether it be because of their past, there is no place for them in the body of Christ. But I'm here to tell you, I don't care where you've come from. I don't care what you've done. I only want you to know God cares where you're going. And God's got a plan for you. God's got an anointing for you. God's got a purpose for you. And with God, there is nothing that is impossible. You will be a mighty powerful tool for the kingdom of God you are supernatural God has this call for you and in this house the preacher the anointing flowing from the head down you don't need to worry about it because we are passionate I'm out come on now I'm out every every Monday and Wednesday I'm out at that uh, in in the parks myself Picking up the garbage, praying for people. I had a young man come up and he said, will you pray for me just this last week? I, lay, I prayed for him right there in the tent. And I want you to know God can meet somebody in a tent in the middle of a park. Why? Because he loves people. Turn to someone and say, God loves people. The next one who came was a man called a Samaritan. Remember we talked about the Samaritans. The Jews hated the Samaritans. Well, this man that was beat down was a man that came out of Jerusalem. So he was a man that had a Jewish background. And who comes to him? Somebody who was unacceptable. Somebody who he would have, listen, somebody who he probably would have walked to the other side of the road from. But yet he was moved with something. He was moved powerfully by somebody. He was moved with compassion. His heart gripped him. and emotion gripped him. And when he looked at this man who was beat down and thought to be dead, his heart moved so plainly that he had to do something about it. What moves you? This, this man saw him. His face was probably torn. His clothes were torn. His money was gone. He had no ability to stand. If you've seen somebody that they thought was at the place of death, I've been there. I've been to the hospitals. They lay limp. There's moaning, but there's usually no life. I want you to know, but this Samaritan saw him, and he was moved with the compassion of heaven. He was moved with the compassion of God, and he saw him. And listen now, when you are moved, there is always a cost. Being an American is an amazing blessing. Can I hear an amen? We live in the greatest country of the entire world. Can I hear an amen? We have the greatest <laughs> amenities this world could ever imagine. Can I hear an amen? How many have a dishwasher besides your wife? Amen. How many of you have a lawnmower that's a, uh, that is powered by a motor, not a goat? How many drove in a car this morning or a motorcycle this morning to come to the household of faith and your gas didn't cost 7 or $8 a gallon? We live in a phenomenal country of freedom where we can come to the house of God. And we don't have to worry about somebody busting in and shooting us all up. We don't have to worry about being arrested when we walk out the door. We are a blessed people. Can I hear an amen? I said we're a blessed people. Can I hear an amen? But many times in our blessing, we forget how blessed we are. Many times in our blessing, our pursuit seems to be getting more than to be giving more. In our pursuit, 
We now are focused on things rather than people. 50 years ago, we used to love people and use things. But today's world is we love things and use people. And it's not outside of the church only, but it's inside the church. And we see that because the majority of churches are not seeing anybody saved. They are not reaching out to the community. They are not doing the work that is letting people know that God is alive and he's not dead. That they're not just a religious institution, but they're the people of God with the answers of heaven. That God will have an answer for their life. But this man was moved. His heart was touched. He felt There's a feeling that happens in your heart when compassion comes on you. When you look at something and all of a sudden it brings tears to your eyes. Oh, pastor, I don't have tears. Nothing is moving me, pastor. Nothing moves me, pastor. Oh, then I declare you have a heart problem. And the heart doctor won't fix you. See, when we're moved by nothing, it means our eyes are not on the things of God. When nothing grips us, when nothing moves us, when nothing overwhelms us, I've seen even the toughest men. Listen to that. It's one of, the, one of the neat things about being a pastor. I've seen these men that could crush me with their hands stand in front of me, and they start talking about a situation in their life, about somebody that they love, and tears start to come down their face. Why? Because they feel something. Listen, I want you to know God wants to heal your soul, your intellect, your emotions, and your will. He wants to restore you, reupholster you, as it says in the book of of James chapter 1. He wants you healed up so that you will feel again. And that some of us will put our windshield wipers on. We'll stop only seeing in our mirror, but we'll be able to see through the, the reality of life and see that there are many people that are less blessed than we are. And they need God in their life. How many of you need God in your life? When you don't need God, you are God. But yet there is only one God. And all the others will fall flat in front of him. Every one of us, no matter where we are in sociological, economical, no matter where we are, when what, the, what kind of clothes we wear or what kind of house we live in, every one of us need God because not one thing can we take into eternity with us. We are people that need a living king. And I don't know about you. I want to make sure my relationship with Jesus is good. I want to make sure that I'm healed up so that God can start using my life to people that are hungering and thirsting after him. They don't even know what they want. They don't know what they need. They might not even know where to go. But you and I are where they are, and we have the message of the gospel, that power of God that sets them free, that power of God that brings the answers, that power of God that heals them in the office, that power of God that breaks off the Monica power in their life. I want you to know today that you are powerful people, and Jesus wants to raise you up to be more than just a Christianette. But God wants you to be moved. What moves you? You know, I was one of those hard cases. I would brag. I I didn't cry about anything. I don't cry. I'm not a crier. I remember one day, one day I was watching Oprah. Had one of those moments. And as I'm watching Oprah, they united a child who was separated from their parent for many years. And I found myself... You ever watch that movie, August Rush? Hey, who's seen that movie, August Rush? I hate that movie. Because I can't, I can't not cry in that movie. That just gets me. If you've never seen it, you can't identify. You've got to go home and watch it today. It's, I'm sure it's on Netflix. And as I'm watching this movie... And I'm really trying to be cool. I don't want anybody to see him on the airplane. I want anybody to see. Because I'm cool. But you know, it's not cool not to feel. It's called cold. Cold people are calloused people 
because they've had constant rubbing in the same place. Therefore, they become hardened so that the wound can't touch the softness of the flesh again. And that type of person walks around, man, almost like a super person. I can't be touched. No, I can't feel nothing. No one's going to move me. No, listen, nothing bothers me. But I want you to know that that is not a compliment. God wants to heal your heart. God wants to take off your callus. God wants to let you feel again. Jesus, the strongest man on this earth. Listen, men, he worked in the trades. He wasn't just the son of the living God, but he worked in the trades, and he didn't have a Makita handsaw. He had a saw with a hammer. But yet Jesus, with the heart of heaven, Matthew chapter 9, verse 36, Jesus had compassion. He was moved on the helpless and harassed. Mark chapter 8, verse 2, Jesus had compassion on those who listened to him preach for three days, and they were hungry. Matthew 14, 14, Jesus had compassion on the sick. Matthew chapter 20, verse 34, Jesus had compassion on the blind. Mark chapter 9, verse 22, Jesus had compassion on the demonized, controlled by Satan people. Mark chapter 1, verse 40, Jesus had compassion on the outcast. Luke chapter 7, 12 through 13, Jesus had compassion on those who lost and were lost and did not know Christ. Luke chapter 15, verse 20, Jesus had compassion on the spiritually lost. We've been created with emotions. And if the only way we show emotion or the only place that we are moved is to satisfy our own self, then the very emotions that God gave us are being abused. But God gave us emotion to feel what other people feel. Not too long ago, I was with an individual, and I, they look good. They smell good, scratch and sniff, the whole thing. And I looked at them, and in my spirit, the Lord told me they're discouraged. And right there, I just started praying in my, in my spirit for that person. God, don't let that spirit of discouragement get on them. God, don't let them get to the place where they give up. God, send your angels to strengthen them. Lord, send the Holy Ghost to send just a fire of heaven in their spirit. God, do something. Don't allow. Listen, I felt. But what happens is when you feel and do nothing about it, it creates a hardening in your heart. Are you out there this morning? So when somebody, God looks at you, God shows you, God gives you compassion for somebody, whether it be they're sick, whether it be they're blind, whether it be they're lost, whether it be they lost somebody they loved, I don't know what that is, but you have, oh, come on now. I remember putting my dog to sleep. I cried like a little baby. I just sat there and cried. My sons looked at me. They didn't know what to do. Why? My dog, I was a dog. Some people have more compassion for a dog than they do another human. Because the dog won't hurt you, but every time you love, you become vulnerable. Every time you become vulnerable, it's inevitable. You will be hurt, and every time you get hurt, you've got to forgive or you cannot love again. And it's time to become people of vulnerability. It's time to be people that will feel again. It's time to be people that will not just feel, but people that will do. This is what I love about Jesus. It was not just that he felt an emotion towards them, but when Jesus felt, he did something about it. Luke chapter 7, verse 13, Jesus felt compassion for her. So what did he do? He raised her son from the dead. Mark chapter, Matthew chapter 15, verse 32, I feel compassion for the people, the word declares. So what did he do? He fed them. Matthew chapter 9, verse 36, I felt compassion for them. So what did he do? He died on an old rugged cross. Matthew chapter 14, 14, he felt compassion. What did he do? He healed them. Matthew chapter 20, verse 34, he was moved with compassion. He opened the blind eyes. When Jesus felt, he was moved. When he was moved, he did something. Compassion always demands a reaction. What moves your heart? What if, what would it be if you, 
saw it right now would bring tears to your eyes. From the most manly man here to the little baby, what would, what would move your spirit? What would take you and bring tears to your eyes and choke you up? What, what would you have to see? What is that emotion that will stimulate that compassion? Because without it, the only thing we do is me. Say it again. Without it, the only thing we do is me. We take care of me. And it's contagious, by the way. You got to be careful who you hang with. I want to be around people like Jesus. Can I hear an amen or oh my? I want to be around people that when they feel something, they do something. That when there's compassion, there'll be a reaction. That when they see somebody that's in need, they're not going to sit there and have sympathy for them, but they're going to go out of the way to do something about it. And I want you to know, those who, those who sow, they shall reap. And God is calling his church to a higher level. I know the last three weeks have been strong messages. Well, why? Because it's time to shake us up. Man, the harvest is ready. The harvest is ready. Jesus is coming. And it's time for the church to get our heads out of our armpits. And do something. Be moved. Well, I don't got time to be moved. Then you're too busy. You can't take any of those things with you to glory. You can't and have any of them stand before the, the throne of God at the beam of seat. They'll all be burned. The only things that will last are those that are done for Christ. It doesn't mean we can't enjoy ourselves. It, can't, it does not mean we can't be pampered. But when we're no longer moved with compassion, then our lives are just so self-absorbed that the only person that we want to please is ourselves rather than our king. 